Hi, this is Dr. Ben Morrill. Welcome to episode 23 of Reptile Genetics Weekly. And we are back to school again this week. We're going to talk a little bit more about genetic variation and move into an explanation of how uh, banana ball python morph works genet in, you know, at the genetic level uh, to make a little bit more sense uh, from what we know from breeding. Um, so we're excited to talk more about that. And thank you all for the, the comments and questions uh, from the last back to school video. We use that as we prepared this to come up with examples and explanations that will help make things a little more clear, I think. So we really appreciate that and keep that coming. Do it again after this video and let us know if there's other topics and things you want to hit. Um, we will be happy to do that. Um, so for an update, uh, we have results went out today for all the panels. So if you remember from last week, I said um, the the big batch that I was going to work on, um, we had a, some quality control problems. Um, but the ones that were good, were clean, were the panels. So we had a bunch of panel results go out today. Uh, so you should have those if they were on this run. And then um, the single morph tests that should have been done last time and double gene morph tests, um, those I am preparing this week. And they will uh, be getting sequenced over the next uh, few days. I will have results uh, at the earliest Monday, probably Tuesday. Uh, those results will be going out. So that'll be a pretty big batch. So if you have been wondering if you have a single, single gene test or a two gene test, and it seems like it's been a long time, uh, we apologize. And that, that definitely each month that goes by um, will be less of that. We're trying to do both designing new tests, which we have some, some uh, news about today, and then also uh, running everything. And, and unfortunately, we got a little bit behind this time, but um, next Monday or Tuesday, um, so by a week from now when you're seeing this video, we should have all those results. And that's quite a few. That's a pretty big batch. So we'll have a whole bunch going out next Monday and Tuesday. So yeah, uh, today I have both Kayla and Travis again since we're doing back to school. How are y'all doing? Doing well. Doing good. <laughs> and uh, I purposely didn't prepare Travis for this because I wanted to <laughs> make this be off the cuff. So uh, we've had you on here a few times now. Kayla and I, I think it was our second episode. We just talked a brief couple of minutes about, you know, how we found reptiles. And I talked a little bit about how I became a DNA nerd. So yeah. you wanted to take a, a minute or two, Travis, and just kind of talk briefly. How, how did you start keeping and or breeding? But when was the first time you did some breeding? And, and how did you end up being a, going down the DNA nerd path? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I went down the reptile path real early. So in preschool, I found a baby garter snake on the playground and I brought it back into the classroom, which did not go over very well. Um, <laughs> ended up keeping it for a couple of days in a little glass fishbowl type of thing. And then my oh. mom made me release it. And I remember afterwards that I drew a picture of me crying, letting the snake go. Um, <laughs> And I'm sorry, pretty that's much really dramatic for small Travis, but that's it, it, it is. But you know, it 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 made a memory for him. Um, <laughs> and pretty much from that point on, I had had reptiles in my life in one form or other. Um, usually, you know, for about the first ten years or so after that, it was just you know every year I'd go out and I would catch garter snakes uh, yeah. and stuff around you know the pond that we had. They had a tiger salamanders so i would pull the larvae out of the pond when they were little and i would grow them up and morph them out and then release them back into the pond um cool. and then at 14 i shelled out 175 dollars of my own hard-earned money to buy an aml corn oh. and i raised that little pink worm up um he you know, made it through junior high, high school, college, when my brother basically neglected the ever loving hell out of him for oh. four years. <laughs> I was only coming back on the summers and dealing with him. Um, mm -hmm. Then moved with me to Georgia, Georgia DNR. You didn't hear that. Um, <laughs> of course, snakes aren't legal in Georgia, which I found oh, out yeah. a week before I actually moved out of Georgia. Uh, <laughs> made it made it up to Maryland with me. Um, and 
then he passed away at the age of 24. Oh. He, he made it a long time with me. Yeah, that's pretty what good. What a good boy. What was his mantra. name? He was Jake. You know. Jake the Snake. Jake the Snake. Awesome. <laughs> um, it was when I was in Atlanta and kind of realized, hey, look, I'm an adult now and I can do adult things. Like I can keep <laughs> my own reptiles that I want to keep. That's when yeah. I started keeping more seriously. Um, I picked up a Chondro. I picked up an Alterna, picked up a couple of other things, um, and then just kind of expanded out from there. That we picked up a, just a bush baby ball python, which I still have him, just, you know, a wild type male. Oh. now. 15, 16 years old. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, still keep him with me because, you know, it's what got me into the ball pythons and then the ball python, just all the crazy stuff you could do with them appealed to me and that was sort of tangential to me. You know, my The reason I moved to Atlanta was for my doctorate where I was pursuing genetics um, and genomics and I was more on that side working with microbiology. So I'm specifically in microbial genetics, but as I have said in many podcasts before, genetics is genetics is genetics, you know, so what applies to microbes applies to macroorganisms as well, like your s snakes and frogs and toads and whales and hippos and tigers and people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and working with g ball pythons and being able to play with the genetics at home and be Dr. Frankenstein was a lot better than bringing the stuff that I was working on in the lab home because that would be bad and we don't want to start the next, you know, international <laughs> pandemic incident <laughs> by bringing my own work home with me. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I've told people many times it's it's all just a tiny bit of clear liquid in the bottom of a really small tube, but I'm much more excited about it when I know the clear liquid came from a reptile. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, yeah, that, that, well, I move clear liquid from one tube and I put clear liquid into another tube with some more clear liquid and I get clear liquid. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we're doing a video for promotional reasons, then we'll yes. add some food coloring. Yeah. Then, then, then we'll add, yeah, we'll add some blue food coloring. And... Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Which we still right gotta on. do at some point. Yes. <laughs> I mean you can you can actually make it visual if you do it the right way. Like the, the do it at home strawberry DNA extraction. Oh, I did that you in know, high you school. You do that right and you just get this huge glob of frosty colored stuff, and that's all DNA. So yeah. you actually can have a tube of frosty colored DNA. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool to do. Yeah. yeah. All right, so for those of you that have been watching, this won't come as a surprise, but we do have some, some morph updates, some morph test updates. And the first one we have is uh, VPI Xanthic. We are able to test for VPI Xanthic and um, our vendors, Clutch and Morph Market, will be listing those as available very soon. Uh, it could be as early as today. Um, uh, it varies a little bit as far as getting things programmed and updated, but. Um, that is good to go. And if you have a panel, this is important for people to know for all three of the morph tests I'll talk about right now. Uh, if you send a panel in and I'm prepping it right now, so you don't have results yet, but it's already here, it will get tested for VPI, Xanthic, and um, Cryptic, and for uh, um, Ultramo. So those are the three we're going to talk about. I guess I just gave that away. but <laughs> um, So... VPI Xanthic came from um, Dr. Heather Rafi and Dr. Alan Garcia Elfring in Canada. So they're the ones that, that uh, found that mutation and validated it. And also with Cryptic, same thing. So very thankful. And uh, I guess go back to the last slide. First of all, I have to say how beautiful this picture is. This is from- It is really, really nice. Yeah, this is from Jake Melbrat sent this over to us today so we could put it on the show. Awesome picture of some BPI Xanthic combos. Yeah. And then for the cryptic pictures, mm -hmm. these came from Inky Clouds. Tommy sent these over, thank you. Um, so we are able to test for cryptic now. So any of you that have clown or cryptic, heck clown or heck cryptic or krypton or cryptic, you know, we'll, before we were able to do a clown test and give you a process of elimination, um, but now 
we can tell you, we can confirm either clown or heck clown or heck cryptic or both or, you know, whatever. We've got both now. Thanks to the Canadian group. Once again. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. And last one. Last one. So also those of you that have been watching know we've been trying to get to where we can test for both ultra male mutations. And so Dr. Hannah Sedell has been working on that. She's the one that originally published the first mutation test for the more common, at least the more common in the United States mutation for ultra male. So we've been able to test for that for, you know, since we started testing mm -hmm. for almost a year now. Um, but now we can test for the second ultra male mutation. So those of you that have gotten ultra male or panel results that included ultra male, I might have said, um, negative for one allele, and that's because we could only test for one, but now we can test for both. So, so like I said earlier, if you have a ultra male test coming in or a panel coming in um, that I'm prepping this week, it will get tested for both ultra male A and ultra male B. And so we will be able to give you a definitive answer if it's uh, negative for both, then you know it's for sure it does not have it's not het for ultra male, so. Awesome. So we're, we're right on track for our uh, prediction earlier. Um, I think a few episodes ago, we mentioned uh, that we planned on having what 40 morph tests or 40 uh, yep. genetic tests total by October, right? Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting close. Yeah. All right. Yes. And so, one more thing with that last picture. Yeah. Thank Ryan Young for letting us use this really cool tri-stripe and tri-stripe ultra male there. Yeah, uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful animal. They What's that? Unreal. That's a beautiful animal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Um, but yeah, we've got more coming um, next week. I should be able to talk about at least one more, uh, maybe more than that. We got more coming, um, and they will keep coming in. I don't know if it'll be every week, but it'll be pretty dang close to that. And I, I'm sure that we'll hit at least 30 ball python morphs um, maybe we can get over four, over 30 but yeah we were saying you know 40 total reptile tests yeah we could be there or dang close to it still so it's looking good sweet so let's talk about our back to school series yeah all right so for the first time we'll say uh you know this is definitely piggybacking off of the last episode so mm -hmm. We do have a prerequisite for this episode, or at least the rest of this episode. If you haven't seen episode or the part one of our Back to School with RGI, uh, you definitely want to go back to last week's episode, episode 22. Yeah. Um, and that will help make sure that this episode will make sense. If you don't, then this episode, the rest of it's going to be kind of rough. So, so exactly. if you haven't seen it yet, pause here, go back, watch last week's, and then come back to this part of this video. Yeah, go check it out. It's going to be right right beside Ben's head over here. So go go look at it. <laughs> and we'll, so, we'll do a really brief review of last week. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be very brief. And then we'll yeah. move on to the new stuff. So uh, last week we ended where we were talking about uh, ways that animals that are in a changing environment uh, can have genetic variation to be able to adapt, adjust, evolve to changing environments. And so we had this picture here with the sire and then the gametes, in this case, sperm that he would produce and colors going back to the paternal grand, grand sire and grand dam. I said it wrong last week, but that's okay. Um, and then the next slide with the dam. All right. So, and then with the dam, you have the maternal grand sire and the maternal grand dam, which contribute to her genetic diversity, which you then see continues to get diversified through her gamete production in the eggs that she produces. And then when those combine together, you get the mass generation of diversity across the board, which gave us our clown poo morphs. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> this was the basically the first level or layer for genetic variation. And today we're going to talk about a second way that genetic variation comes into play here beyond just the independent sorting of chromosomes. So in first we wanted to show here, this is a karyotype, which is what, what happens is we, as molecular biologists or cytogeneticists, we blow open cells and then we uh, lay out the chromosomes that are in metaphase. 
specific part of the cell cycle. And so we're looking here at chromosomes. Each pair here, one came from this individual's mom, one came from this individual's dad. And these are paired chromosomes. These are actual pictures of real chromosomes that have been um, exploded out of the cell, laid out, and then um, made, you know, we're, we're going in. They don't lay in pairs like this. Somebody's gone in and moved each so that they're by each other. <laughs> so, uh, so that way you can actually see what chromosomes look like. A lot of the time we, we show them, we picture them as like that X shape, um, but they actually most of the cell cycle it's a big spaghetti bowl they're spread out all over everywhere but it's just during this metaphase when they're getting ready to to divide that they'll they'll condense like this and be in in specific chromosomes so this is what they actually look like mm -hmm. and then uh this next layer of genetic variation is what's called crossing over so just like that picture we just saw with the karyotype, we have um, one pair of chromosomes that are pictured here. And since the DNA has very similar uh, code, since these, you know, it's the same chromosome, one from mom, one from dad, the majority of the sequence is going to be the same, like over 90%, probably over 95% um, is going to be identical. And so those those two chromosomes are kind of drawn to each other because there's there's homologous sequence and what can happen is as they come together they can actually swap parts of their chromosomes and so as you come from the, the top of that picture down to the bottom you can see where the two cro cross over in the middle and when they cross over like that since there's so much homologous sequence they can actually break and switch and so you end up in the bottom with a chromosome that has the majority of the information coming from the we could say in this case it's the maternal grandsire and then the one on the right the majority of it is from the maternal grand dam but a little bit got swapped so not all the genetic information from that one chromosome is from just the grandsire or the grand dam now there's a mix and so that's how you add even more genetic variation you have anything to add to that, Travis? No, I mean I was I was waiting for this slide to come up because this is this was a great way to visualize it, you know, beyond just like the little abstract cartoons of X's. So, you know, you've got your first generation of your gummy bear where you get half and half. And if now you have the red chromosome and the white chromosome, and that one breeds with a green chromosome, you notice that the three offspring there, each of them have a different proportion of red to white, and that would be from the different crossover events that occurred along those chromosomes. Yeah. So you get that, that breakup and it shifts around the diversity of the genetics for each of those animals. So, mm -hmm. and it just continues to happen along the line. Every chromosome can do that. And the further apart two points are like the top and the bottom, the higher likelihood they're going to shift across because there's going to be something that flips them around each other. Yeah. Mad props to whoever spent a day or uh, I guess an hour or so dissecting gummy bears for this because yes. it's yes. so good. It yeah. is. I, I wish I could give credit to the person who did this, but I remember finding this years ago and just thinking this is a perfect example of genetics and I will save it to my hard drive and I didn't even think yeah. to who made it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know who it's from, sound off in the comments, but I don't know. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to kind of zoom in on one specific chromosome and show some examples of where traits, uh, the genetic code for traits are on a specific chromosome. So in this case, we're talking about a, a trait or a code that codes for pattern that's towards the top there. And then toward the, the bottom, we have a code for eye color. So these two traits, they're on the same chromosome. And so some of the time they're going to get passed together because they're on the same chromosome. But since they're so far apart, a lot of the time there's going to be crossing over in between them. And so these are far enough apart on that chromosome that from a breeder standpoint, you're probably not going to see eye color and pattern passing together. So like if it was a clown pattern and silver eyes, 
you wouldn't necessarily see clowns with silver eyes all the time. There's enough crossing over going on that it's going to look like they're completely independent. They could potentially even be on different chromosomes. So as long as the two traits are far enough apart, you won't even know that they're they're on the same chromosome. They basically yeah. move independent of one another. Mm -hmm. This gets us to our crazy morph for today, <laughs> the banana ball. Let's go. Yes. Uh, if you're at all familiar with ball pythons you and you know any of the history behind the banana, this kind of drove the community nuts for many, 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 many years. Uh, I would say it still kind of drives the community nuts because I don't think everybody fully understands it. Mm -hmm. um, this is a sex-linked trait, and every once in a while, that sex linkage will kind of do weird things where a female will always produce female ball pythons that are bananas and then a random male banana will pop out from her breedings. Just another yeah. example of the banana here. Yeah. This so one from Leviathan to, Snakes. Yes. Thanks Leviathan Snakes. I think they got a, a video for us too, right? Yeah. Like this really pretty morph. Just a cute little snake. Yeah. Very cool ball pythons. That's for mm -hmm. sure. So with the banana, the reason that we see this strange, uh, change of the sex that's carrying the trait is because we're dealing with linkage, which has to deal with that crossover event that we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the sex chromosomes of ball pythons, you know, or in this case, just a random sex chromosome here, you can see that we've got scale color and sex determining factor. They're much closer to each other than we had the pattern and eye color. And because they're so close together, when you get a crossover event, it's much less likely to break those two apart. So they tend to travel as one unit most of the time. But every now and then, you get the perfect crossover event that separates them. And when that happens, the sex determining factor moves one way, and then the color change factor moves another way. So that's how you can get a female who traditionally only makes females suddenly now makes a male who has the different color, the, the banana mutation. It's and then the converse cool. would hold true every once in a while. You get a male who produces all males will suddenly produce a female because it switched through a crossover of it. Yeah. Yeah. So in the case of this picture, that last picture where we're oh. saying that's a <laughs> Y chromosome, if the banana mutation was on this chromosome, then this would be a male maker. And the majority of the time, this male maker is going to pass that Y chromosome that has banana on it to his male offspring because every Y chromosome he passes is going to make a male. But every once in a while, because in Python, ball pythons, the X and Y chromosomes are so similar, and that's why it was hard to develop a sex determination test for them. Uh, but every once in a while, the X and the Y will have that crossover event happen between the sex determining factor and the banana mutation. And when that happens, then the banana mutation is on the X chromosome. And so an X chromosome can be in either a male or a female. So if that X chromosome is in a male offspring or is in a female offspring from that male, then... From then on, you know, that female, it's on an X chromosome. And that's why when you breed female bananas, you can make a male or a female with that because both males and females have X chromosomes. And so that's why when you breed a female, you can get both. Yes. Oh, that's cool. And so we had an example of this in a study of someone who did, uh, well, yeah, a study. <laughs> yeah, so this is just a study done. And out of 862 offspring sired by male bananas that were produced by male bananas, so male makers, and 346 offspring sired by male bananas that were produced by female bananas, so female makers, um, they found out that there were crossovers 6.6% .6 of the time. And so there's pretty good numbers. It's pretty cool that, that they went through and that many clutches and, and figured out the, the numbers and uh, it's so it you know those are large enough numbers you can be pretty sure if you produce 100 offspring from a male maker you're going to get six or seven that uh you know that, that crossover has happened you can either get a 
a female banana or a male normal. Wow. And the, you know, Ben, Ben was right pointing out this, this number, you know, this is a very large number. This is kind of the same thing that Ben is talking about when he's just making his tests. He, he wants to test a lot of things to make sure that we're actually seeing what we want to see and having 1200 independent animals looked at to find a, you know, this statistically significant change. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a lot better than just looking at 10 going, yeah, sure. Six, six out of 10 or, you know, 0.6 yeah. out of 10, not six out of it, six out of a hundred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my, my brain wasn't working there for a minute. <laughs> that's okay. So in this last example, we're just showing a hypothetical example where two traits are right by each other. So if we have two different genes that are right by each other, that both cause a different phenotype, you know, one could be color, one could be pattern, whatever, however you want to think about it, but it's two different things that are right by each other. Those are going to pass together all the time. Maybe not perfectly a hundred, but it's going to be like 99.999% of the time. And so to us as a breeder, it will look like they're allelic and we wouldn't be able to tell the difference because they'll always pass together. And so there's some mutations that, that we think of as being allelic that we may find out are actually two different uh, mutations on two different genes, but they're just really close. They're so closely linked with such a high linkage disequilibrium that they always pass together 99.99% of the time. And yeah. so some of them, it could be something like, you know, Enchi and Black Pastel, we've always thought of as being allelic because they seem to pass like their allelic genes, but it is possible they're actually two different genes, two different mutations, but they're just really close together on the chromosome. And so crossing over doesn't ever happen in between them. And How honestly, we... something I'm still wrapping my head around, but I think you've explained it really, really well. Well, that's um, what I was just going to ask is how, how we're doing. Yes. Yeah. We, um, we, we have to rely on you to tell us if we've gone too science nerd. No pressure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I think I like, I think it's pretty good. Um, this might sound, this might be kind of a silly metaphor, but going back to our little crossing over uh, animation, well, not animation, but image here. Uh, the thought I kept having when I looked at this was, oh, they're trading boots. You know, um, <laughs> which I mean, that's not necessarily how it works, but it could be helpful, you know, um, or, you know, if they traded a, a, a smaller section, maybe they were just trading shoes instead of full boots, yep. Uh, yep. you know, uh, and so that could help explain once you get to this point, you know, if on the bottom you're trading uh, or how about I said, I said, um, you know, on that top arm, if you're, if it's trading just a, shoe from that that's why you might get a scale the scale color without the sex determining factor but if they traded the whole boot or the whole arm of that then they would get Both. that entire section um yeah. which i i guess that's a metaphor that might work for some people um but that's uh kind of what kept, kept coming to mind when i thought of crossing over and um how close some of these genes might be um and what was that big fancy word you used for uh you said dis disequilibrium linkage disequilibrium linkage, yeah. linkage disequilibrium yeah so if it's um, two different traits that aren't yeah. linked that aren't close together at all yeah then you expect them to pass independently so you would expect them to pass like pied and clown do you know right you, you wouldn't expect there to be any hint at all that they're allelic Mm -hmm. But if there's linkage disequilibrium that's really strong, they're right by each other, there's yeah. very high linkage disequilibrium, then mm -hmm. it will look like they're allelic. They'll they'll look like they pass together all the time. And you'll you'll think that you need a uh acts like a super um to be able to to uh have but technically you could actually be homozygous for both. But since like if it was the odds the case, of it happening are really low. Exactly. Yeah. If it was the case with Enchi and Black Pastel that there are two different genes right by each other, which this is hypothetical, I don't know if that's the case. Yeah. Um, but if that if they are two different genes real close to each other, then you get Enchi from dad and and Black Pastel from mom, they're going to be on two different chromosomes. You would mm -hmm. have to have a crossing over event happen in between those two 
to be able to get both black pass down and chi together. And yeah. then since they're so close, those would never separate. So it would seem like it's just one trait. One trait, yeah. You know, it would always be that way. And that's, you know, another thing you could talk about is the difference between a lesser and a butter. It could be the difference between a lesser and a butter is there's a second gene in lesser that's not in butter or vice versa. And so it makes it look a little bit different. They, they look basically the same a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. but they were picked out as being two different things because they kind of looked a little bit of a different color and a little bit of a different pattern yeah um, that we could eventually find out there's a second gene linked to one or the other that makes a slight difference and you just can't tell because it has both those mutations and they're so close that they always pass together yeah so i think some people are going to ask in the comments after this do you think that if those were the case that um what rare genetics is doing uh, could that determine, you know, the NG pastel difference or the butter and what, the, what was lesser. the other one? Lesser. Butter, butter and lesser, lesser uh, yep. difference. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it, it's actually more the work that Eastern Michigan is doing and the Canadian mm -hmm. group that we, we thanked earlier in the episode. Uh, yeah. They're the ones that are really going into the genes and sequencing base by base um, in a whole gene. And so Ooh. like with the yellow belly complex, that could have been possible. It could have been that Ooh. yellow belly was one gene and asphalt was another, but since they went through that whole gene and sequenced all of it, we know it is part of the same gene. They're yeah. different mutations on the same gene. Um, so that's not work that we're specifically doing at Rare Genetics Inc., but it yeah. is the kind of work that both the Canadian group and Eastern Michigan group are actively doing. Yeah. So do you think clarify maybe on that, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was going to say, uh, do you think if and when we get Dr. Seidel uh, on the show, do you think she'd be able to talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, I, I hope so. That yeah. The uh, Canadian group, um, Heather and Alan have both had, uh, agreed that they'd like yeah. to come on. So I've, I've reached out to, to Hannah as well, but she's, she's buried in first of the semester stuff. So when we That's hear cool. back from her as well, we'll... We'll have them come on sometime and I also talk think about she it. just had a kid too. So that could yeah. be that could be oh, tying right. up yeah. a lot of her time too. <laughs> okay, yeah, totally fair. She's very busy. <laughs> Heather and Alan though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what were you gonna say, Travis? I was gonna say just going off of what Ben was saying a little bit, mm -hmm. like when when they're when when Ben looks at it, he's just kind of looking at this is a chunk of DNA. And yes, there are these changes in this chunk. When uh Hannah's group and the Canadian group, Heather and Alan are looking at it. They're mm. looking specifically at like, this is where the gene starts and this is where the gene ends. Do the changes that we see happen between that start and end point? Or do we see one where it starts and ends here and then another one starts immediately thereafter? And there's, there's a different change here. So you have two different genes that are so close to each other that again, that linkage disequilibrium means that those two genes basically move together as one unit, but yeah. they, they do two different things by themselves. Hmm. So that's, that's kind of the difference between what Ben is looking at. He's just looking at, there's a big piece of DNA here and there's a lot of changes and I can show that these they're close to each other, but I don't know whether that means it's the same gene or not. And the Canadian group and uh, Eastern Michigan group are actually looking at is this specific piece within a start and end of a very specific gene. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the work they're doing is, is very valuable and it's very cool that there's enough interest. Um, at least they're pushing hard enough that they're able to do that work without getting in trouble by their departments. <laughs> That's yes. how it kind of goes in academics yeah. when it's a, a species that academics as a whole aren't that interested in. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really cool they're doing that because then we understand at a much deeper level. Travis yeah. is always asking me questions, specific questions that have to do with the, the genes and the pathways. And I'm always like, well, you have to ask, you know, Hannah or Heather that. <laughs> they're the ones going much deeper. For me, I, I just need to develop a test that will help breeders. I don't need that deeper understanding to develop a test. Um, but I definitely love it. Just like Travis, I love knowing that. And it's very cool. And the yeah. papers that they've written are, are awesome with that kind of information for people that want to go even deeper into the protein and, and the pathways and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very, very cool and very valuable. Yeah. Uh, 
if there was a way we could like, if we could like link brains at some point or I could work with them and we could make some sort of visual that like in the weeds for dummies, uh, you know, as a, as a video topic someday, but I don't know. And maybe yeah, if, yeah. If, if somebody's into that. So I'm sure uh, we can find a way. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Get your thoughts. Let us know in the comments. Travis uh, and I are good at being in the weeds. Yeah. Um, I, I'm holding on for dear life at the back, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I get in so, trouble sometimes on, on calls with uh, business people and Sean. Mm -hmm. After the call's over, Sean's like, you went way too much into the science stuff. They just wanted a simple business answer. I'm like, well, oh. you should have spoke up. Tell me to be quiet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> All right, so I think that's all we have for today. Um, so uh, Travis, Ben, thanks so much for uh, you know getting into the weeds a little bit more than we did last week and um, teaching us some new uh, some new ways to look at uh, sex linked genes. Um, and yeah, got any any um, final thoughts? Yeah, for just like last week, add questions, add comments, let us know. You know, hit us yeah. up directly on the feed. Hit us up independently. We're all happy to chat about this stuff. Yeah. Especially yeah. Ben and I. Like I said, we'll, we'll take you into the weeds. Yep. You may <laughs> get lost with us, but. <laughs> yes. Keep the keep the questions coming. We got several from Roger from Gray Family. I think it's Gray Family Snakes, Gray Family Reptiles. Yeah. And Gray Family Reptiles. Yeah. He had some really good questions and. There's some other people as well that definitely keep the questions coming and we'll happily uh, talk about whatever you want to. And, and once again, thank you to those that, that submitted pictures for us to use and to the Eastern Michigan group and the Canadian group for helping to push this along. We definitely would not be anywhere near as far as we are without the work they're doing and their students sure. as well. It's awesome. And yes, yeah. please do like, share, subscribe all those good things that definitely makes a difference mm -hmm. uh, if there's uh things that you're learning and liking about this that's a way you can support and help get this out to more people and make it so we can keep on doing this all right well everybody wave goodbye to the fly on ben's head that's been here for the episode he's <laughs> <laughs> coming, keeps coming. He i had to wave at it a bunch of times yeah that's no, fine he's part of the stream now yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. Maybe not Thank the fly, you. but maybe he'll come back. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm throwing three, two, one.